Hey, welcome back, folks. Today, what we're going to do is take a look at Dalton's Law of Partial Pressures. And the neat thing about this is, is that it doesn't matter what type of gas you have. It doesn't matter what the gas is, that if you take those gases and you add them together, their, their, their pressures add together. And so it doesn't matter if it's hydrogen, helium, oxygen, nitrogen, carbon dioxide. It doesn't matter what the molar mass is that when you add them together, all we're adding is their pressures. And the example of this is, is scuba diving tanks. So if we were to have, say, a scuba diving tank, we would say the pressure total, the pressure total inside of that tank would be equal to the partial pressures of whatever gases we're talking about. Now, that could be like P1 plus P2 plus P3. It's just whatever gases we have. And it doesn't matter what the gases are. Like I said, the molar masses are not important. It doesn't matter. And we can do this and, and look at, at these things like a mole fraction. And that is to say, what is the fraction of whatever gas we have in, in our container? And in this case, it could be like an oxygen tank or, or maybe a scuba diving tank. And so we'd say then that that mole fraction, this is just the symbol for mole fraction, it's just an X with an I. The mole fraction would be equal to the gas that we're interested in in moles, like this, divided by the total number of moles of gas. So N total. So all of the gases together here and in the denominator, this is the numerator is on the top, is that right? Okay, thank you. I, I was never big at math. I, I, I liked math, and then they started using Greek letters, and then it was like all downhill from there. Okay, so this is just a mole fraction. We don't use this a whole lot in, in general chemistry. You might see a little bit when you get into Gen Chem 2, but it's another way of expressing our proportions of gases. Now, the real-world application of this is scuba diving. Has anybody here ever gone scuba diving before? Wow, we've got a few people that have gone scuba diving before. Okay, where'd you go scuba diving? Dominican, okay. A bunch in California. Lake Superior, yeah. That's where I went because I don't have any money, right? How about you? Epcot and Disney. It's like, is that where you find like Mickey Mouse? And yeah. Well, that'd be way more awesome than like diving in the mines. Well, the sharks, that'd be exciting. That would be cool. Very cool. Okay, so when you go diving, um, they have some rules. And, and you can go down, you do your thing, you know, talk to the fishes and such. But when you come up, when you come back up, do you remember some of the rules about ascending? Like, what's a big no-no? Yeah, you don't, you don't come up all at once. You, you have to go slowly. And, and sometimes you have stops. And you, you have to like go up so far, and then you have to just stay there for a while. And does, does anybody know why that is? Why can't you just like, well, oh, time's up, got to go. Why can't you do that? Yeah. Yeah, yes. So the excess nitrogen that's in your blood will come out of solution. The thing is, is nitrogen is not very soluble in water. And you're mostly water. You're just like a big meat sack with water, right? And, and nitrogen is not very soluble. But if you put nitrogen under pressure, such as when you go scuba diving, that nitrogen gets dissolved or forced into your blood, which is no big deal when you're down low and you, you have high pressure. But that's science. But then if you come back up too quickly, you don't have that pressure on you anymore. And without that pressure, then the nitrogen comes out of solution. And you end up with these big bubbles of nitrogen in your blood, and that's bad. They have a name for it. It's called the Benz. And it's not like getting a side cramp. It's like you will die. So um, what do you do? How do you prevent this? Well, people that dive really deep, and this is a picture of somebody diving in a cave in Mexico. Um, one of the things that they will do is they will mix oxygen with helium because helium is not very soluble in your blood. 
And with that, then you don't have to worry about the bends so much. Now, I've always found this really fascinating because when people come up from, from diving with this, they sound like Mickey Mouse, right? Because they've been breathing helium, which I think is just hilarious. They're like, hey, did you see any turtles down there? Oh, yeah, they're really cute, right? So the question is here, if we have mixtures of helium and oxygen and we're using them in scuba diving, uh, for a particular dive, we got 46 liters of helium and we've got 12 liters of oxygen at some temperature and pressure and such. It says calculate the partial pressure of each gas and the total pressure inside of the tank. So we've got these two gases. We're going to put them into one scuba diving tank. What's the pressure inside of the tank? And so we can use Dalton's law of partial pressures to figure this out. Now, if you're like me and you see all this stuff and you're like, I'm not sure where to go with this, right? Okay, there's a lot of numbers there and ooh, I've got a lot of equations I've been juggling around. What do I do? What I like to do is just write out what I have and sometimes that helps to guide me to where I need to go. So, starting out, we'll just take a look at, say, helium. And then what numbers do we have associated with helium? Well, with helium, we've got um, our volume. Our volume is equal to 46 liters. And then it tells us we have a temperature that is equal to 25 degrees Celsius. But I've been trained and conditioned now to not leave things in Celsius. I changed them to Kelvin. So that's 298 Kelvin. And then my pressure, that is one atmosphere. And then I'll take a look here at my oxygen. And so oxygen, I'll just leave a little space here. We'll go oxygen. And with my oxygen, I've got my volume is equal to 12 liters. My temperature is the same, 298 Kelvin, and my pressure is one atmosphere. So that's the gas before I put it into the tank. And then I'm going to put it into my tank. And when I put that into my, my, my scuba diving tank, my volume then becomes five liters. Five liters. And then my temperature is the same, 298 Kelvin, 298 Kelvin, and then my pressure, it, it says calculate the pressure. Okay, so I don't know what that is. That's something I got to figure out. Like that. So that's the information that I have, but when I look at it, does that now kind of guide us? Do you, do you, can you think of an equation that, that, that uses this stuff? A few moments later. PV over T? Yes, PV over T. PV over T equals PV over T. Okay, yeah, looks like that. And sometimes we go like one, 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 two, 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 like this. And so I could go, one, 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 two, two, two. One, 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 two, two, two. Like this, yes? And then just solve for P. So I'm just going to take this equation here and I'm going to solve for P2. I'll just rearrange this equation and I'll say here then that P2 is equal to P1V1 times T2 all over T1 v2. I'm just solving here for p2. And then I can plug numbers into this and solve for p2. So if I plug numbers into that, I've got one atmosphere and my volume here is 46 liters and then my temperature is 298 Kelvin and then I divide this by my other temperature, 298 Kelvin. Looks like those could have canceled out. And then I'm left with um, volume two is five liters. Okay. So then once I do the math on that, 
I get some number, and I came up with 9.2 atmospheres. So 9.2 atm, 9.2 atmospheres. And, and what is that? Well, that's my partial pressure of helium. So I would say here that my partial pressure of helium is equal to 9.2 atmospheres. The total pressure in the tank is going to be my partial pressure of helium plus my partial pressure of oxygen. So I've got first step here. The second one here, I just take this and plug it into my equation here. And I could write that all out, or should we just, we just, we got it? No? Write it out. Okay, that's all right. I get paid by the hour. It's cool. All right. Okay, yes, let's plug some numbers in here. All right, so I've got here P is going to be equal to P2, and it's just, it's this equation right here. And I'm just going to plug in my numbers now for this one. I'm going to have here one atmosphere, and I'm going to have here 12 liters, and my temperature is 298 Kelvin, divided by 298 Kelvin, and 5 liters. And then when I'm done doing the math on that, I have 2.4 atmospheres, 2.4 atmospheres. And so that now is my partial pressure. So I say my partial pressure of oxygen is equal to 2.4 atmospheres. And if I add those two together, the partial pressure of helium plus the partial pressure of oxygen, that should give me my total pressure. So that's going to be 9.2 atmospheres plus 2.4, 2.4 atmospheres. That will give me my total pressure. And so my total pressure inside of that tank is going to be 11.6 atmospheres, 11.6 atmospheres. And notice it didn't matter what the molar mass of these gases were. Didn't matter that one was oxygen, one was helium. Could have been carbon dioxide. That would make scuba diving really exciting. But it doesn't matter what the molar masses are. Dalton's partial pressure law. Any questions on any of that? Okay. Alrighty. Then I'm gonna, I'm gonna clean the board here. I'm going to clean the board and I'm going to show you how we use the partial pressures to calculate gases that we collect over water. Now, when we collect gases, this is a, a typical technique in chemistry labs where you want to create a gas, you want to collect it. And so in this example here, we have potassium chlorate. And we put it into a test tube and heat it up under a Bunsen burner, or over a Bunsen burner, uh, the potassium chlorate decomposes and produces oxygen gas. That oxygen gas can be fed through a tube and then collected in this beaker that's turned upside down. And then the, it collects bubbles of oxygen. Bubbles of oxygen. So the, the top of that, that beaker there that's turned upside down, that is um, hopefully contains oxygen. Now, that, that oxygen is also mixed with water. There's water vapor that comes off of the water. And, and can mess with our calculations. But the total gas that's, that's trapped there, the, total, the pressure total of that gas, is equal to the pressure of the oxygen plus the pressure of the water. Now, somebody has gone and done most of the work for us. And so this is a table that you could find in your textbook. And it shows us that for each, each um, temperature, there's a certain pressure of water vapor. And as you notice, as you increase the temperature, the water pressure, or the pressure, the partial pressure of the water, increases. It's, it's like as you heat up the water, you get more water vapor, which shouldn't be a surprise, right? So somebody's done all the work on, on this and created a table. So that's, that's helpful. So now if you have a question that says, okay, you're going to take some potassium chlorate, you're going to heat it up, you're going to decompose it, you're going to produce oxygen gas, that oxygen gas is collected over water, well then how many grams of oxygen are actually formed? 
How do we figure this out? Well, we can use Dalton's partial pressure law to do this. So now, if we look at the table here, it tells us that the partial pressure of H2O at 30 degrees Celsius is equal to some number. And we just look here on the table and say, oh, well, that's 31.8. So that's 31.8 torr. Now, if I wanted to convert 31.8 torr into millimeters of mercury, how would I do that? It's the same, right? Want to, want to watch me do it again? Right? It's, it's the same number. Because there's 760 torr is one atmosphere is 760 millimeters of mercury. Okay. Now, for our equations, we have to convert this into atmospheres. So there's 760 torr per atmosphere. And so then that is equal to 0 0.0418 for two atmospheres, and that's way too many sig figs, but I'm not going to round till I get done, until I finish. All right, so there's my partial pressure there. And we have learned that our pressure total is equal to our partial pressure of oxygen plus our partial pressure of H2O. Pressure of H2O. Now, I've got my partial pressure of H2O. That's this. Now I need my partial pressure of oxygen. Well, wait a minute. No, yeah, that's what I want to find, isn't it? Yeah, that's what I want to find. So if I rearrange this equation, I could solve for my partial pressure of oxygen. I can say partial pressure of oxygen is going to be equal to um, my pressure total, my pressure total, minus my partial pressure of H2O. Okay, and I've got this number here, right there. And then I need my pressure total. Now my pressure total, oh, it tells us that, doesn't it? 1.015. So that's 1.015 atmospheres minus 0 0.041842 atmospheres. And so then that is equal to 0 0.973158 atmospheres, which is still way too many sig figs, but we're going to wait till the end. All right, so there's some pressure there. And now, let's see, what else, what else do I have? Um, I do have, I think, a volume. My volume here, it tells me, is 821 milliliters. 821 milliliters. Okay. And let's see, I've got a temperature. Temperature is 30 degrees Celsius plus 273 equals 303 Kelvin. Um, and, and then I also have my, I've got my pressure here. Pressure is 0 0.973158 atmospheres. And it's asking me, it says, how many grams? I want to figure out how many grams. I'm just going to put grams here for now, because I don't know what those are. Um, I've got volume, I've got temperature, I've got pressure. What equation might I use? One eternity later. PV equals NRT. Okay, thank you. So PV equals NRT, and I can solve for N here. So I can say my N is equal to PV over RT. And so my pressure is 0 0.973158 atmospheres. And my volume is, I can't put that in there because it has to be in 
liters. Okay, so how do I convert that into liters? Divide it by a thousand. Thousand milliliters per liter. Okay, and I'm really just moving the decimal three spots over. So then that becomes 0.821 liters. Thank you. And then R. What's my value of R? Oh, you've got a hat on. That's a great hat. I like that hat. That's a nice hat. What's the value of R? 0 0.08. Yep, yep. That, you're absolutely correct. Something, something? Yeah, yeah. Two, zero, six. Good guess. Yep, all right. Nicely done, nicely done. And then what are the units on that? They're goofy. It's, it's some really goofy units. Liters, ATM, over moles, Kelvin. Nice. Thank you. Nicely done. And then our temperature is 303 Kelvin. And so when we do the math on all of this, we end up with 0 0.032117 moles of oxygen. And I go, okay. All right. No? No, I'm not done yet. I've got moles. Got moles. How do I convert them to grams? Multiply by the molar mass because a mole of O2 is some number of grams of O2. How many grams of O2? 32. Not 16 because there's two oxygens there. Okay, nicely done. So then if I do that, well, I'm looking at the wrong sheet. Here we go. I come up with 1.03 grams of oxygen. Okay. Whew. Nice. Nicely done. Thank you for your help on that. All right, so that's the partial pressure laws, and that, that's... That's all we're really going to do with that. Now, gas is behaving. When we started all of this, we had five rules. And as long as gas has followed those five rules, all of these equations worked. And those five rules were things like the molecules, when they run into each other, they don't lose energy. They have elastic collisions. They don't stick to each other. They bounce off of, of walls and such. Well, it turns out it's not always true. If you have a container with some gas, and you increase the pressure, in other words, you force those molecules really close to each other, well, then they will start interacting with each other. And when that happens, then the gases no longer behave ideally. So we say that gases behave ideally under certain conditions. So we say that gases, um, say gases behave ideally, Are there two L's in ideally? There's also an S at the end of gases because that's like French, gas A. Right? Uh -huh. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, gases behave ideally when we have low pressure and we have high temperature. And what does that mean? Um, low pressure means like, like one atmosphere, as opposed to like 100 atmospheres when we, we cram them all together. And then high temperature. This is a little odd, but Calvin, this is a biggish number at room temperature, as opposed to a low temperature, which might be like absolute zero. At absolute zero, gases start behaving like liquids. And, and so we say that gases behave ideally at low pressure and high temperatures. This is, this is good. This is, the, this is where our rules work. Because if we're at very high pressure and very low temperatures, then our gas laws don't work anymore. Now, 
somebody went and did a whole bunch of work and came up with an, an equation. It's the Van der Waal equation. And the Van der Waal equation looks like this. Now, you don't need to write this one down. But you can see there's pressure and there's volume, PV, and then there's NRT. And what this does is it corrects for very high pressures and very low temperatures, which we don't encounter at room temperature and pressure. So this would be extraordinary circumstances. So chances are you probably won't use something like this, not in a laboratory, because you'd have to be near absolute zero, in which case you'd be dead. Um, but that is an equation that adjusts for all of that, which is very important because then if you don't recognize that, this doesn't make sense. Yeah, PV, NRT, PV equals NRT is going to work for, all of, for everything we're going to be doing in this class. But that is making the assumption that gases are behaving ideally.